Okay, you all see yourself. Okay, we can start at once. So just be here. Yes. Cool. Well, um, thank you for inviting me to uh, talk, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is a little bit of an unusual talk for me, I guess, because I thought, oh, I'm going to talk in computer science. Let me talk about something that's computer sciency. Um, and then I also thought, oh, I'd like to talk about something new that I've never talked about before. So this is all kind of unpolished or something. But um, there's some computer science -y stuff and there's some cognitive -y stuff. But uh, because it's all kind of new, I'd be um, kind of especially interested to hear people's thoughts on places to go with it or connections to other literatures or um, kind of neat other ideas. So um, this is some, some work that's joint with Ev Fedorenko. Um, she's actually the, the person who asked, I think, the kind of important questions be behind it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk, um, talk in this talk first just about infinity and natural language. Okay, so uh, just an overview of the idea that um, natural languages seem to allow an infinite number of sentences, right? There's an infinite number of things that are grammatical, and I'll talk about a couple of um, uh, related interesting special cases, one of which is Piraha, which is a language claimed not to be infinite. Um, and the overall question of the talk is, is why do you get infinity in natural languages? So why aren't natural languages finite um, as opposed to infinite? Um, and um, then I'll develop two kinds of arguments looking at the role of different kinds of constraints in trying to figure out why natural language uh, allows an infinite number of, of sentences. Um, first one will we'll argue that infinite languages really can't come from complex processing mechanisms. So if you just make the systems that process language really complicated, that won't get you infinite languages. Um, that's a, um, using some tools from formal language theory and, and those kind of uh, areas. Um, the second argument is that infinite language will come from a pressure for many signals, um, which I'll, I'll talk more about. Uh, that is. Okay, so let me just start by talking about infinity in language, right? People have probably seen, uh, people are probably familiar, I guess, with this, this nursery rhyme, the house that Jack built, right? And you can say, um, you know, this is the house that Jack built. And this is the cheese that lay in the house that Jack built, or this is the rat that ate the cheese that lay in the house that Jack built, right? You can keep going with this, and um, nursery rhyme just kind of builds and builds into more and more complex sentences. And the observation um, is that this is a pretty interesting thing you can do in English, right? You can take any sentence and you can make it longer. Um, you can embed a sentence, you can add adjectives, or you can modify one of the nouns. Um, and because of that, you, there's no kind of upper bound on sentence length, and there's no upper bound on the number of sentences that are in English, um, at least to a first kind of approximation. Um, and uh, this idea that there's no kind of upper bound or that there's an infinite number of sentences that are grammatically allowed, um, people have thought of as a really kind of fundamental thing, um, maybe a fundamental thing that makes humans different from other species. So here's a quote from Lasnik. Um, infinity is one of the most fundamental properties of human languages, maybe the most fundamental one. Uh, people debate what the true universals of language are, but indisputably, infinity is central. Uh, here's a, another one from Epstein and Hornstein. Uh, this property discrete infinity, infinity characterizes every human language. None consists of a finite set of sentences. Uh, the unchanged central goal of linguistic theory over the past 50 years has been and remains to, to be to, to give a precise formal characterization of this property and then explain how humans develop or grow and use, dis and use discrete discreetly infinite linguistic systems. Okay, so a lot of people think that, that this feature of, of human language is really important. Um, and there's, there's lots of uh, kind of arguments people give in either linguistics or in the sort of intersection of linguistics and formal language theory. Um, or, you know, trying to show that, that uh, language is infinite. One of them is the, the house that Jack built argument um, where I can take any sentence and I can always say, uh, you know, if I have a sentence, I can say, and believe the sentence. So if I have a sentence like, John liked barbecue, I can always say, Bill believe, John liked barbecue. And now that's a valid sentence, and so I can make another one. I can say, Mary believed that Bill believed that John liked barbecue, right? And I can keep doing this on and on. Um, and I'll just point, point you to some sort of interesting critiques of this argument. So Jeff Pullum um, has this kind of fun paper where he, he talks about uh, trying to actually make this sort of formal and mathematical and figure out uh, um, what a, a kind of formal argument for infinity would be, and he basically rejects this argument and some others. But it's, a, it's an interesting kind of paper, actually. I think I've read it like five or six times, and every other time I read it, I think it's convincing. And then every other time I read it, I'm really confused. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully you get the sort of intuition, though, that there's uh, uh, something neat going on with being able to build bigger sentences. Um, of course, in English, it's not just that construction, right? It's not just um, 
believing that something or you're modifying nouns. There's lots of places um, in English where this seems to occur. So conjunction, I can, can join two NPs. Um, so I can say like Bill and Tom were happy, or I can say Bill and Tom and Cindy were happy, or Bill and Tom and Cindy and Frank were happy. You can just keep, keep going like that. Um, I can nest possessive, so I can say, you know, John's sister's husband's barber's dog. That's a complicated thing to understand, but um, you can see that the rules of English probably permit me to put a lot of those in there and uh, have sequences of adjectives in these things. Um, and of course, you're probably thinking about all of this, that, that you know, at some point things get really hard. So if you remember the last line of the, the house that Jack built, um, that's, a, that's really hard to process and follow and keep straight who's doing what and where the cheese is and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, in language processing, right, there's, it's well known that, that processing mechanisms can't handle more than a few layers of embedding or recursion like this. So um, here's a kind of famous case of center embedding. So if I said the mouse ran, it's a pretty good sentence. If I said the mouse that the cat ate ran, that's a pretty good sentence. Um, so all, all I did is I, I modified mouse. So the mouse is still running, but I added a, that the cat ate in the middle there. Um, if I had another one, things just break down completely. Right, so I say the mouse that the cat that, that a boy chased ate ran. Sounds like a total kind of nonsensical thing. Um, in fact, if you ask people to complete these sentences, they think it sounds better without the last word, which is actually what did. Um, so the mouse that the cat that a boy chased ate. So, oh yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it's, there's other funny results. So, so one of Ed's results, for instance, is that your ability to, to uh, correctly complete these sentences is correlated with IQ. So if you're having trouble, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that, no, it's a joke. Everybody has trouble. Some more trouble than others. Yeah. Um, I'm having trouble with the distinction between this kind of sentence and like the nursery rhyme one. Yeah. Where in the former case, I can look at it, and even though I can't really keep track of where the cheese is going, um, I can say, yeah. okay, this is grammatical. Yeah. But this seems different categorically. Like it just doesn't look like a real sentence until you really like. So, yeah, so, so one difference is that in the, in the, the House of the Jack built examples, they're, they're kind of tail recursive. So you're, you're adding stuff on the right. end, whereas here, what really makes it hard is these verbs at the end. And they're the kind of non-tail recursive feature, because they have to connect to whatever the nouns were. So I guess that, that makes me skeptical about infinity. Yeah. Because yeah. we get infinity if it's tail recursive, but there's like a, a kind of a hard limit. Yeah, so, so this is... Yeah, this is why I call it complications of infinity, <laughs> right? So there, people have this sense on the one hand that whatever the grammatical system is, it seems to permit infinity, right? Like the rules of grammar, you know, seem to say that, you know, I can put an adjective before any noun or before any adjective in a sentence, right? And so if, if I can just apply that rule over and over again, then I can generate an infinite number of sentences. On the other hand, you know, we're like finite <laughs> beings with finite memory and stuff, and so we can't actually generate things that are so big. So this is a kind of confidence performance distinction that people make. I guess what I'm trying to say is that this suggest. doesn't seem like uh, performance or memory. Like yeah. there's some, something about the structure that's different here that you know, even though you yeah. know, Chomsky can write down the rules that he come up with this, um, it seems different. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's certainly related to processing mechanisms and what kind of structures are easy and hard. So I think, for instance, these sentences get easier if you put pronouns in them. Which is a weird kind of thing. Like you can, if you can process three with pronouns, then um, that that means it's not uh, it's not strictly structure. Or it's not strictly you know it's it's some, somehow related to your mental representations and your you know, limitations and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it also might be the case that when you get these sentences, you're running into a different typology, linguistic typology that isn't English, but it's very fun. So you're going to have to shift the way that you're putting the structure. You mean like be again. because this grammatical structure is kind of weird it's for English? Yeah. yeah. Practice with them actually increases your confidence. Oh, it does. Oh, yeah. good. <coughs> That's good to hear. Not to mention prosody. Yeah, also. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, this question of infinite language, right, is um, really closely tied to the question of, of whether all languages allow syntactic embedding, right? Whether they let you put a uh, one kind of a phrase inside of a, another kind of phrase. Um, and um, questions of infinity and embedding and recursion all get kind of muddled together in that in the in the linguistic communities or the typological communities, people often don't, don't pick very precise definitions of these things. And so they end up getting into debates about whether all languages are infinite or whether all languages allow recursive syntactic structures or not, or those kind of things. So I just wanted to talk, just mention, I guess, very briefly this language called Piraha, 
Um, this is a, a <coughs> language spoken in uh, the Brazilian Amazon, about here. Um, and Dan Everett, you may have heard of him, is, is the, the kind of uh, main person who has studied here. He went down there as a missionary, and as he says, the, the tribes converted him to atheism um, because he saw how happy they could be, and they just weren't weren't taking his uh, his kind of missionary advice. Um, and so uh, he converted to, to atheism and then decided to, to study this uh, this tribe like academically. So he learned Piraha, him and his wife are essentially the only speakers. Um, one more Steve Sheldon, who was the, the missionary before him. Um, uh, aside from the, the Piraha. Oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Non-Piraha speakers, that's right. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, and uh, why they're interesting, so their, their language has a bunch of interesting features, and I would, I would recommend Dan's book. It can be whistle, there's all kinds of, kind of interesting things with it. It has a very tiny phonological inventory. Uh, but the key claim here is that Dan thinks that the language is actually finite. So he says that um, there's a, a, a finite number of languages in Piraha, uh, sorry, a finite number of sentences in Piraha, and there's even an upper bounded sentence, right? So, so there's one sentence that he can write down where you can't add anything to it. So you can't insert additional adjectives, you can't modify any of the clauses in it, you can't do anything with it. Um, and just to, to give you a sense of you know, how this works, um, I have some, some, um, some sentences in English which have these kinds of embedded, embed embedded structures, um, which are converted to sort of Piraha. So this is not actual Piraha or actual Piraha syntax, but it'll, it'll show you how you can have a system which is uh, sort of bounded sentence length, but you can still communicate the same set of meanings. So I could take a possessive like Joe's sister's husband was happy, right? That has a, a possessive of a possessive. Um, and I could just break it into separate sentences. So I could say Joe had a sister, his sister had a husband, the husband was happy, right? And now my, my English sentences don't have any, uh, they don't have more than one possessive, any of them. And so you can write a, a grammar down that doesn't allow you to sort of generate arbitrarily many of them. Um, a couple of, of other examples. So, so here's uh, the man who attacked the foreigner was upset right here. Um, we're modifying the man with who attacked the foreigner, right? That has a, a verb and an object inside of it, so that's like like embedding a sentence or part of a sentence in there. Um, and I could say the man attacked the foreigner, the man was upset, um, right? That doesn't involve any, just has simple kind of uh, subject verb object structures. Um, okay, there's another one, it doesn't matter. Um, quotations are a kind of interesting case, right? Because quotations um, are usually analyzed in English as, as one sentence embedded in another, right? So if I said, Bill said, come here now, come here now is an English sentence, and that's like the object of said, right? That's the, the thing that he said. Um, and so I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would write down that as, as kind of one sentence with another one inside of it. Turns out in Piraha, you can't say anything like that. Um, uh, you have to say, Bill spoke, and then you can say, come here now. <laughs> And you might wonder, like, well, how, how do you tell the difference between those? Because if you just saw the sequence of words, you know, Bill said, come here now, you wouldn't be able to tell whether there's a sentence boundary or not. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of Dan's work on Piraha goes into trying to figure out, like, which of those two things is, is actually right. Um, and so, so this, uh, this question of, of kind of language being finite is, is really controversial. It's controversial because uh, people like Chomsky have, have talked about um, how infinite language is, is one of the key kind of distinctive properties of it. Um, so here's Chomsky and, and Dan flipping each other with, <laughs> with things. Um, so he, he, he gets called all kinds of names for this. It's called like a, a pure charlatan, I think is, is the quote I have. Um, um, or racist, right, for thinking that this language is, you know, somehow simpler than, than English or other languages. Um, and it's a really interesting kind of hard issue, right, because you want to be objective about it and you also don't want to be racist. So, I mean, I don't think Dan is, is racist or judgmental of this in, in any way. Um, um, on the one hand, on the other hand, it's really hard to get good evidence about, you know, what kinds of structures are allowed in any particular language, as well as what kind of structures are allowed in languages in general, like what kinds of things are the, the supported universal systems. Um, so, um, I just bring this up because we've, uh, we've recently been writing a paper on Piraha where we took a, a, uh, a big collection of Piraha sentences and, and analyzed them to, to look for these kinds of structures. So th these were on the order of a thousand sentences or so which were uh, recorded by Piraha speakers and then we shallowly parsed them, um, uh, aligned, translated them into English um, and had kind of overall English glosses. Um, and you can take this corpus and then look through and see like, you know, when an independent person thinks that uh, this sentence has two possessives in it, right? What does the Piraha look like? Does the Piraha look like it has this kind of structure? 
Um, and if anybody is, is into machine translation or anything, we would love to have uh, somebody look at this kind of corpus. You know, it, it, it'd be really nice to, to have some kind of formal tools that they would be able to say, like, yes, a recursive grammar does well on this, or no, a recursive grammar doesn't do well on uh, explaining this corpus of text. Um, but what, what you can do this, with this corpus is you can actually write down a, a regular grammar that will, that will parse all of the sentences. Um, so you can write down a kind of finite state machine that will do it, or you can write down a kind of ordered constraint version. Um, so here's, uh, here's one, one version of an ordered constraint where I have a topic I might talk about, a vocative, a subject, um, some uh, temporal and, and locative NP markers. Uh, I'll eventually get a verb, I'll get an object, and I can repeat a topic at the end. Um, and in the, in the corpus, these stars are, you can think of as like regular expression stars where um, it turns out I can start a sentence by repeating a topic some number of times. So I can say it two or three times. Um, and if you think of them really as stars, then I could repeat the topic a lot at the beginning of the sentence. That's not a very sort of interesting kind of structure. Um, turns out in the corpus, we only find them two or three times for, for each of those. Um, so um, the, the kind of 10 second take home from, from Piraha is that if you look in this corpus, you find that the, the kind of things that give you infinity in English are not present. So we don't find things like embedded uh, possessives or sentential complements or adverbials or belted clauses. Uh, complementizers are like the house the jack built, for example, um, or coordination. We don't get, get any of those kinds of things in Piraha. So our, our kind of analysis of this is that um, uh, recursion, well, so infinity and, and recursion and those kind of related concepts probably, um, probably aren't present in Piraha syntax, um, but there's, there's sort of interesting interesting quantitative questions of trying to figure out, you know, how, how you would uh, how you would compare different grammars quantitatively and figure out which ones are, are really the best ones. Um, yeah. I'm having a little trouble, well, on a couple of dimensions, but I'll just mention one. Um, the distinction between what I'm trying to say yeah. Yeah. and how the grammar how the grammar how the same. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. And for example, earlier, when I think of two non-embedded ways of saying the same thing yep. makes me now wonder what you mean by <coughs> or what Chomsky would mean. Yeah. Making me a bad guy. Yes. About this being kind of degenerate language that doesn't usually occur. Because it yeah. kind of doesn't need to if it, it doesn't express the same if it can express the same thing. Yeah, so um, it's it's really interesting. So I, I think that um, all of these kinds of cases, you know, you, you have a meaning which is structural or recursive or embedded or something, and you just have to get to it some other way. And so the, the claim can't be that they, um, their conceptual systems are fundamentally different in that sense, right? The claim really is kind of narrow about the syntactic system and what's allowed in the, the syntax of the language. And these really point out that the syntax of the language is really separable from the, the conceptual system. Right? These are cases where the syntax is non-recursive, but the high-level conceptual meaning um, maybe is or has some other kind of structure. So um, when you say it like that, it seems unimportant or something. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, more or less the same question. I was just going to ask if there's anything that, any idea we can express in English that can't be expressed in this language? More or less the same. An idea that we can express in English that you cannot express in Piraha? Yeah, so it turns out they, they also don't have quantifiers or number words. So if I said, you know, there are 35 people in this room, there's just no way to say that. I could name them all, but not. Yeah. Which is a way of saying it, though. Right. Well, it, it, it's a way of naming people in the room, but it's not the same as conveying that right. there is a cardinality right. that is So there is a difference. So. I mean, that's kind of a hard question to even think about how you would answer it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the number stuff is a little bit different from what you're talking about. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, so that's just a weird feature of Piraha. But in, in terms of syntax, I think that's, that's hard to answer. Um, so like you could say, is there a sentence I could write in black that you couldn't translate into blue, independent of number? And I don't know. Yeah. Has anybody looked for regularities in the order of sentences in Piraha? Like maybe you could think of like, it's basically like what we are calling a sentence. Maybe that's just some crazy construction for a word, so maybe there's a finite number of sentences, but they're like functioning as complicated words. Yeah, so I, I, I think that another way to say it is that the, the sentences themselves are simple, but there's lots of discourse relations, meaning connections between the sentences that say like, you know, this sentence is clarifying, you know, who that person was that I referred to in the previous sentence. Yeah. And evidentials, yeah. right? And evidentials, and yeah, yeah, there's like, yes. Yeah. 
Tons. Yeah. Yeah. So just very quickly, are these examples actual glosses of sentences that would occur or multiple sentences that would occur in the um, these are not actual sentences, but they're close to actual sentences. Um, so yeah. I mean, this is like English translated into English in a way a Pirahaw speaker would. <laughs> so, sorry, while yeah. we're on this topic, yeah. I've been like, like exactly in this slide when you like sliced that sentence into multiple ones. I was wondering if like this phenomena called like infinity in language has been uh, sort of studied from semantic point versus the syntactic point. Yeah. Because like in semantic point, if you assume that each sentence is trying to, you know, so somehow assign states to entities in the world, is yeah. that true that that can be in like that can be infinite and you can still make sense like yeah, be so, valid or so I, I think that that if you if you treat Piraha discourse as the thing you're studying, then there's an infinite number of things you can say. Um, if you treat like a single isolated sentence as the thing you're studying, then there may be a finite number of things that, that, that could be. Um, yeah. So actually, the, the next thing I was going to talk about is um, just point to, to some, some other work about uh, kind of infinity and recursion embedding in other kinds of domains, which gets at the, the sort of semantic issue. Um, there's this neat example from, from Levinson of, of where you can actually find these kind of recursive structures in, um, in discourse con constructs. So, um, here's a, a dialogue that he had um, found somewhere in Switchboard or something like that. But somebody says, would you like to eat, uh, what would you like to eat? Roast beef on rye, mustard or mayonnaise? Excuse me? What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Do you want the mustard or the mayonnaise? Mustard, please. Okay, so here you're, you're, you're kind of nesting the questions, right? Where uh, this excuse me is asking about that question, and this what is asking about the excuse me, right? And then you answer them, you kind of unravel and answer them. So this answer is being given to that what, and then this answer is being given to the to the excuse me, and then this answer is being given to the other question. Yeah. Okay, so this is this is that kind of case where you can get um, kind of nesting, maybe infinite structures or something, in, uh, uh, not within sentences, but but across sentences. And this even comes up in kind of conceptual domains. Domains. So here's some some finger <laughs> artwork. Okay, this is uh, a glove whose fingers are are made of hands. Um, and here's my favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I can stare at that for hours. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, I mean, there, there's, there's actually kid experiments which are pretty cool, which have um, sort of kids' understanding of fractals and things. So you give them a couple couple layers of the fractal, and then you see if they'll generalize the fractal in the right way going deeper. Um, uh, so, I mean, people are kind of generally interested in conceptual recursion and, and uh, reuse of structure. Okay, so. Um, that's the, the, the kind of overview of infinity in natural language. Let me give you an overview of the, the actual setup of the talk. Okay, so um, stepping back, we're sort of interested in, in why or how infinite languages might arise, right? Like why might it be the case that, that languages are, um, are uh, infinite or, or finite? Um, and um, there, there's two kind of related questions that, that I'll talk about here, the, the informal versions of those questions. Okay, so question one, if you build a complex enough brain or processing system, will you tend to have infinite languages? Um, so um, that comes from this kind of picture. This is like a cartoon of, of human evolution where you have time on the x-axis and brain size on the y-axis. Okay, and you can see that over the past, you know, a couple hundred thousand years here, uh, brain size has just gone crazy. Brain size has, has doubled or, or tripled. Okay, and uh, this is a, a big question, right? People wonder why you have a huge explosion in, in brain size. What's driving this? What makes humans really, uh, really different from our, our kind of closest ancestors? Um, and um, so, one question this might raise is, well, you know, if you just get a really complicated brain, right? Let's say that um, there aren't other kinds of pressures on um, on you. Would a complicated brain just in general tend to give you infinite languages or not? Does that make sense? Um, here's a second kind of question. Um, so it turns out that, that in the, the formal version of this that I'll talk about, the answer is, is no. So if you think about computational systems, as they get more complicated, they don't tend to get, uh, they don't tend to generate infinite or finite sentences very strongly. Um, and so we thought, okay, what, what else could it be? Well, you can do a similar kind of analysis where you think about languages that are that are forced to communicate many signals. So if I uh, if I sample a, a language that uh, has a certain size, as that size gets big, 
eventually, not only does the size of the thing I, I sample uh, get big, it'll, it'll have a high probability of actually being infinite. Um, and so I'll talk about that, that, uh, uh, that claim in a second, sort of formal version of that claim. So um, the, the, the formal version of, all of this, I guess, is to think about kind of maximum entropy distributions on programs. So the idea here is, is to try to make very minimal assumptions about the actual processing mechanisms that are, uh, that are dealing with language. So, um, and, and just think about what, what happens to kind of general computational systems as you put some constraints on them. Um, so to do this, we're going to think about uh, programs where each bit of the program is generated with a, a coin flip. Okay? So you can think about a, a Turing machine and a tape where the thing you've written on the tape is just a, a, a random sample. You can think about a Python program where you're just like a monkey on a typewriter and you're typing stuff at random. Um, and the, um, the, the kind of overall background for this right, comes from Kolmogorov complexity, um, comes from uh, thinking about the complexity of, of sequences as the complexity of the shortest program, which will, the length of the shortest program which will generate them. Um, and there's people who've, who've taken that idea and applied it to um, sort of put probabilities on it. So there's an area called algorithmic information theory, um, which sets up exactly this kind of question. So the question is, you know, if I run a random program, what kinds of outputs will I tend to get? Um, and there, there's, there's people who've even taken that kind of idea and applied it to questions like artificial intelligence, which are really closely related. So these are questions like, um, if I can solve this, if I can solve problems about doing inferences with random programs, then it turns out you can solve all kinds of problems in artificial intelligence with a really simple kind of system. Um, the downside is that you can prove that you can't actually solve any of the problems. <laughs> um, so um, it's this kind of very nice, kind of pretty mathematical area um, uh, that if you could solve it, you would, you would uh, have kind of elegant ways of, of solving inferential problems more, more generally. Um, but it turns out for the stuff I'll talk about, you don't actually have to solve uh, solve any problems. So um, um, here's the a slightly more formal version. Well, what happens to a random program is you constrain them with, with number one or number two. Okay, so what should we expect uh, the influence of constraints on kind of rich algorithmic systems to be under no other pressures? So if you think about having a, a language, you could think of a formal language or a program that recognizes a formal language. Um, I might just have some distribution on it, or I might have a conditional distribution where I've added some kind of constraint. And the constraint that I add might be a constraint that says this thing has to be you know, above a certain level of complexity, or it might be a constraint that says this thing has to, be, uh, has to have at least a certain size. Um, so the, the, the idea here is this kind of picture of constrained randomness and what constraints do. And I just want to point to an analogy, which is the, uh, the capillary action analogy. So um, if you read the Wikipedia this morning, like I did on capillary action, um, you will see, you will have seen that um, the, the capillary action is this really kind of puzzling phenomenon, or at least it was to early physicists. Um, so, right, capillary action is, is where I'll, I'll have some fluid and it will get sucked up a, uh, a, a, narrow, uh, a narrow tube. And so flowers write out narrow tubes in their stems and they'll, they'll adopt the color of whatever fluid you put them in if you do this with celery or things. Um, and uh, why this is an analogy, right, is, is that um, capillary action is this, this kind of surprising consequence of, of having a, a system which is constrained, right? It's like I have a big vat of, of liquid and suddenly when I constrain it, I get this kind of weird behavior out. And the weird behavior is that the, the fluid goes up in flower. Um, uh, this is, is analogous, right? This is a, a, a system where, um, you know, I have some distribution on, on languages and I want to see what happens when I constrain it. If you constrain it, is, is it ever the case that um, uh, you can learn something about infinity or, or not infinity. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first argument is, is kind of in, this, in, in that spirit, right? Um, it shows that infinite language won't come from complex processing mechanisms. So um, what the, the formal version of this looks like is we think about a program that recognizes a decidable language that we'll call LP. So P is a program and LP is, is the language. Um, and uh, like in all these other areas, so like in algorithmic information theory, you can assume that there's a distribution on P given by the, the program length. So if it's this distribution where I'm just flipping coins, um, then my probability of a specific program will be like two to the minus length, right? It'll just be a whatever the, the coin flip is for each part of the 
Okay. And so, for instance, if I want to think about things like uh, what's the probability that I get an infinite language, well, then I, I have to add up over all my programs two to the minus length of that program over all the ones which are which are infinite. Okay. So that's just the, the, the kind of basic setup of things. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, we're, as I said, we're interested in these kind of conditional distributions. So you can ask things like, um, if I build a complex enough brain or processing system, will I tend to have an infinite language? That's a question like, if uh, what's the probability that my language is infinite given that my program is at least a certain length? Okay. Um, question number two, right? If uh, if language is pushed to communicate many signals, will my language be infinite? So that's like saying, if my cardinality is above some bound. Will my program be sorry? Will, will the language my program decides be, be infinite? Okay. So um, there's there's two kind of key claims. So the, the, the first one is is that uh, this first guy, right? The, the probability that I'm infinite, given that my my length is at least k, um, stays away from both zero and one, and it stays away uniformly. That doesn't depend on on what. Okay, so you can take this as a, a negative result that if I increase complexity, then that won't make me an infinite language. Um, and I'll just go through really briefly kind of what the, the sketch of that argument is. Um, the sketch is basically that um, I can pair up the finite and the infinite languages and they have to be close to each other in length. Okay, so for any program that generates an infinite language, I can find a, a unique one which generates a finite language that just takes like the first couple elements of it. Um, and um, the, the difference between these, between a, a, a p that generates an infinite and a p prime that generates a finite, um, that has to, uh, their difference in lengths is going to be bounded by some, some value m, uh, which is constant over p. k m is the length of a program that simulates another p and accepts only a finite number of its, of its elements. Okay, so I can always take a, an infinite language and I can make a, a finite one um, by essentially writing something that simulates the infinite one uh, only for some uh, some proportion, some small number of, of its elements. Um, and vice versa, if I start with a finite language, I can also pair it up with an infinite one. And I can do that by having a language which, having a, a, a another program which uh, runs p and then uh, inverts the yes, no answers. So if I start with a finite language and I invert the yes, no answers, I'll get back in an infinite language. Okay, so that, that means that, um, uh, my finite and my infinite languages essentially have to be, well, for every finite language there's an infinite one which is close in length, and for every infinite one there's a finite one which is close in length. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll skip a little bit of the math here, so I'm a little bit low on time, but basically you can use that, that property <coughs> to show that uh, these two probabilities are, are close to each other, right? So. Um, the, the probability of getting an infinite language is, is close to the probability of getting a finite language because the, the probabilities only just depend on the length of the programs. So if the length of the programs are close, then the probabilities also have to be close. Um, and basically what, what, what that shows you is that the, uh, the probability, the sort of conditional probability that something is, is finite versus infinite uh, will stay away from both zero and one. So as I, as I make programs more and more complicated, I don't get uh, I don't get to be very certain that they're finite or very certain that they're, they're infinite. Okay, so the sort of overview of the first argument, right, is that you compare every finite language with an infinite one uh, and vice versa, and you can do so uniformly by thinking about these, these programs that will, will simulate other programs. Um, therefore, our distribution, which depends on program length, will never be pushed arbitrarily close to, to zero or one as you make as you require programs to be more and more complex. Okay, so increasing the complexity of a program or a brain or a language processor doesn't make it uh, kind of defaultly more likely to to deal with infinite languages, um, uh, or doesn't make it kind of arbitrarily high probability that it will deal with with infinite languages. Okay. Um, we talk about question two. So if a language is pushed to communicate many signals, will it, should you expect that, that, that it will be infinite? Um, and the, the kind of contrast to have in mind here is animal communication systems, which tend to have way fewer numbers of signals. Okay, so um, kind of famous case is um, these, uh, these monkey calls. 
Um, right, this was uh, kind of uh, famous finding in communication and, and, and sorry, in, in animal cognition um, of monkeys who make different <laughs> calls depending on what kind of predator is nearby. Okay, so um, here's the call for leopard, here's the call for eagle, and here's the call for snake. And um, you can tell that they're, they're using these really to communicate and not just to, uh, not just like when you see a leopard, you make that call because if you play the call when there isn't a leopard around, it'll, it'll, the animal will, will take a different action to avoid it than it would take to, to avoid a, an eagle or a snake. So if you play an eagle call, it'll run to kind of dense, uh, dense shrubs and stuff and try to hide. If you play, play a leopard call, animals will run up into the tree and kind of hide. Um, and if you play a snake call, they'll look at the ground and cautiously move around. Okay. So um, what's interesting, I guess, is, is that there are animals that, that can communicate with these kinds of systems. Uh, but what's relevant here is, is that there is not many signals that they have, right? So it's on the order of three uh, here, at least in, in the original work. I think that in subsequent work, people think it's on the order of um, uh, you know, a couple dozen, like 20 or 30 or something like that, uh, distinct calls that, that, that they can make. And I think that that's um, characteristic of animal communication systems more generally. So um, um, it's hard to find animal communication systems that have more than a couple of dozen calls. Um, even things like Coco the gorilla, right, where you take an animal and you raise them and you're trying to teach them uh, explicitly with lots of effort, lots of different uh, sign language signs, um, still only learns on the order of a couple hundred hundred of those signals. And so um, what's different about people, right, is, is that we actually have lots and lots of signals. So we have on the order of, you know, tens of thousands of words, and we're able to put those words together in really complicated ways. So we have exponentially more sentences than that. Um, and so the question is, like, if you're, if, if you go back to this picture of taking programs and constraining them in some way, the constraint that you introduce is that the language has to be a certain size, right? So it has to, um, uh, has to have at least n elements in it, um, will that tend to push you towards, towards programs and processing mechanisms which are actually infinite, um, which don't have just more than n, but actually have an infinite. Yeah. I, I, I totally buy your argument there about size, but it seems yeah. like maybe this is not quite the best example to illustrate that, because it seems to me that their problem is not necessarily that they don't have enough calls. Yeah. They just have a failure of imagination about what the hell to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. there's an eagle there, yeah, and he's there right now. But yeah. if you if if you have to convey the fact that there's an eagle there at three o'clock yeah. tomorrow afternoon, then they probably would have evolved slightly more complicated ways of putting these calls together. So yep. it sort of gets back to their semantics. Sound meaning. Yeah. Huh? Sound meaning. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the conditionals, right? That they that they kind of do. Yeah, so the semantic issue is really interesting. Um, and but but you, I mean, you could use a different example. You could just say, let's yeah. take a, I don't know, an 18 month old who's got in productive language, I don't know, 50 words. Sure. You can compare that to an adult who's got 50,000 words. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. As opposed to going the cross species route. Yeah, yep. Cool. Okay, other questions? So let me just put this, this kind of thinking into the, the sort of formal language theory set up from before. So um, here we want the probability that a language will be infinite given that it's greater than, than some bound. And the claim is, is that um, as you make that bound bigger, this probability will, will go to one. Okay? And the argument for this is actually very, very simple. So you just write down what this probability is. Um, well, the probability that it's... Uh, that it's infinite given that it's greater than b, that's the probability that it's infinite and greater than b divided by the probability that it's greater than b. It's just the definition of additional probability. Um, this thing on top is really the same as this thing, right? because if it's infinite, then it's also greater than b. And this thing on the bottom, well, you can be greater than b either by being infinite or by being less than infinite. Okay? So this is just a rewriting of the conditional probability. Um, and then what you'll see is, is that as you vary b, the only term that changes is this guy. So as b gets bigger and bigger, this guy will go to zero, and so the whole fraction will go to one. Um, and there's, there's an, an easier, easier way to state all of this, maybe, which is that um, uh, as I increase the, the bound, as I increase b, I'm going to have to throw out finite languages. But I'll never throw out an infinite language, because an infinite language will always be, uh, 
will always satisfy the bound, right? Um, and that means that as I increase p, my infinite languages will come to have to dominate in probability, right? So I'll, I'll eventually have very close to probability one of, uh, of actually generating an, an infinite language. Okay, so um, I guess you could say languages or communication systems that are pressured to have many signals will, under this kind of random algorithm story, uh, come to actually permit an infinite set of signals. Okay, so you don't have to assume anything detailed about the processing mechanisms or about, uh, you know, what's interpreting these programs or something. All you have to say is, is that there's, um, there's some kind of system which can, can do computations, and that system that does computations is constrained evolutionarily to, to send out a lot of signals. And if it sends out enough signals, then it will, it will actually permit an infinite number of signals. Okay, so the reason for this is very bland, I think, right? The, the, the lower bound will throw out finite languages, but not infinite ones, and so the infinite ones come to, to dominate in probability. Um, and it's worth comparing this. I mean, it sounds a little bit obvious when you say it like this, um, that increasing a bound has to increase the, the size of the languages. Um, but it's actually not so obvious that if I increase the bound on a language, it will, um, if I, sorry, if I increase the bound on the size of a language, that that'll make the infinite ones more probable. Right. Um, so you can compare this to other cases like a, a Gaussian random variable, right? If I say, you know, sample from a Gaussian conditioned on it being greater than a bound. Um, as I increase that bound, the mean that I sample will increase, but I'll never sample something at infinity, right? My, 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 uh, uh, the thing I sample will always have a, um, have a, a finite value. Okay, whereas this is saying, you know, when you deal with these, these languages and when you think about programs, um, as you increase the bound, you'll start to sample ones which have an infinite cardinality, um, and that those will come to dominate in probability. If I can kind of say something. Oh. Okay, so um, infinity I mean, language may not be so surprising in a kind of communicative context, um, assuming that the specifics of the language, meaning the processing mechanisms and the program which come to, which generates it in some sense, are, are to some extent random. Right? So even if you assume they're random, all you need to say is, is that there's lots of signals around. And once you, once you have that, then, then you have, oh, it's, it's really, really probable that we should see infinite languages. Um, and so you can think about this another way, which is uh, what's the kind of thing that, uh, that would falsify this, right? That you could falsify this kind of reasoning if you, if you found an animal that had a huge number of signals but only a finite number. So if there's some animal that communicated, say, 10,000, which is on the order of human lexicons, 10,000 different signals, but uh, only exactly 10,000, <laughs> right? Um, then uh, then this, would be, this would be no good. Okay, so um, let me just wrap up. So there, here's the, the summary of this, this kind of thinking, right? If you build a complex enough brain or processing system, will you tend to have an infinite language? You can think about that as this kind of conditional probability. And if you assume that the thing that is processing the language is uh, to some extent random, then you can just say that, that no big brains alone won't get you infinite language, right? Just making a processing system complicated won't tend to push it to be finite or, or infinite. On the other hand, if you push language to have to use many signals, that's the, the second argument, then you can say yes, if you pick a, 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 random, a random language with enough signals, you'll have a high probability of getting one that's an that's infinite. Okay, so the main idea here, though, I think is, is the, the sort of overall approach. So the idea of thinking about properties of cognitive or neural systems as the result of kind of constrained random processes, right? So all of the, the proofs and, and math stuff all, all depend on uh, thinking about picking random programs. And you might think like, oh, you know, it's really not plausible over evolutionary time or something that we're random programs. Um, but, you know, there's, there's features of, of evolution which, which are random. And if you think that, if you can show that these results happen for random programs, then that might make you worry less about kind of explaining the details or the specifics of where these, uh, where these come from. Um, so I made this analogy to, to kind of capillary action and to the, the fact that there, you can get these kind of surprising effects of constraints on systems. You can think of these as sort of surprising effects of, uh, of constraints on kind of probabilistic um, language processing systems or something. And so the kinds of things I'm interested in thinking about are other kinds of properties of language which are 
uh, considered very basic, like, uh, like infinity. So if you think about things like compositionality or discreteness or arbitrariness or uh, having hierarchies or what computational complexity language is, um, all of those are, are the very basic things that I think don't have uh, very good why explanations for. Um, and so I'm interested in thinking about, you know, are there explanations that, that take this kind of approach, right? So are, are there constraints you could think of that would tend to give you languages which are compositional and tend to give you languages which are arbitrary or, or hierarchical? Um, and that's all. So if anybody has any questions. Could you, I could think of maybe other ways to uh, get a similar result without the randomness. Yeah. Um, so have you thought about that? And, you, know, you know, say you're an intelligent designer and you're designing a system, you know, maybe you could come up with some sort of similar argument, right, about the, the size of your program versus its output, coding. Issues. Yeah, so I think that there's related things for compositionality, for instance. So if you say that um, I want to convey a lot of signals, but I want to have a simple processing mechanism, then it makes sense for me to, you know, uh, define a, a system which puts together pieces in, in some way. Um, and so I think, yeah, there's, there's related arguments like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about the probability part of the last argument about, like, once you have so you have a language with a certain size, how likely it is to be infinite. Yeah. Um, maybe there's something I'm missing here, but doesn't that depend on certain assumptions about like how many languages there are of a certain length? Because like if there's uncountably infinite enough languages of a given length, then um, you know, looking at a shorter length, it's sort of like saying that there's fewer real numbers between one and two. Yeah. Than there are I, one and two. I think everything here is countable. I mean, I've only thought about it in countable cases. I don't know what the uncountable cases are, but um, um, well, the number of infinite languages is, but the number of computable infinite languages is not. Um, so there's a countable number of computable ones. Yeah. Okay, so there's a couple of things that come to my mind. Yeah. Um, in, there's a, a very real sense in which infinity is just trivial, right? What do you mean? In the sense that you just add one, all right? And so yeah. those kinds of systems, it's just additive. Yeah. Right, and in those kinds of systems, when it's kind, of, it, this gets at the issue of the sort of um, syntagmatic processes that we assume, and then in the notion that English is a kind of meta language. Mm -hmm. So, like with your in English example of um, John said X versus John spoke X as being one more complex than the other. There's a sense in which what is lacking in that is, for instance, in languages in which John spoke has morphology on it. It's mm -hmm. exactly the issue of morphology. Sure, yeah. Um, and those can be extraordinarily complex. Systems. Yeah, so, so Pirahau, for instance, has really complicated exactly. verbal morphology. Exactly, yeah. and that is why yeah. it's not, yeah. So the minute you run into yeah. morphology, morphologically complex systems are difficult for both L1 and L2 speakers. They learn the morphology late, and for every word, that word is deeply embedded in massive neighborhoods of sometimes thousands of forms with slight different. Yep. Those I think of as complex. Yeah, sure, sure. So I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. I guess I didn't mean to say, if I did, that that Piraha is, you know, objectively simpler than other languages. I mean, I, I think that its syntax doesn't allow embedding. Its morphology is more complicated. It has a. Those things I think um, are aligned. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so those get into your I issues of compositionality. Morphologically, complex languages are non-compositional. Um, there's n very little recursion. You know, yeah. to get into those, those, those sorts of issues. Yeah. 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 Also, just to add on that discourse, right? We talked about that earlier, right? So it's offloading into other parts. Into other parts of the. Yeah. 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 I have to sort of I have a question here, but I, I didn't quite know how to phrase it. It's sort of along the lines of, of what I told you I would ask you at the beginning. What was the title of your talk again? Let's start. Oh, first. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Did I not do it? And rise from change. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this so, is the, the second argument, right? Like, yeah, this is the second. So it, 
if I'm understanding your, your, your argument as to sort of how we have arrived at this infinitely large plane, is that we've sort of shifted this bound continuously upward until we've been <coughs> sampling from essentially infinite numbers. Uh, yeah, so that, that's the argument. I mean, we actually, Evan and I started this the other way, where she said, oh, you know, I, 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 I bet that if you just make brains complicated enough, they'll right. make infinite languages. And so, and so sorry. yeah, sorry. So, so the, the, the first negative result was the, the first one we figured out. And then we thought, oh, well, what's a reasonable kind of second, like, what's a reasonable thing that could give you infinity? And then it's that, yeah, it's increasing. And so the, the pressure to shift the bound up is essentially to account for uh, situations that you want to describe that are becoming more complex, or, or the, the complexity of the situation you want to describe. Not that the situation is becoming more complex, but if you want to yeah. describe it as becoming more complex. You it's have more things of, you want to convey as part of the Yeah. And, okay. So then, so then I, I guess just the question that I asked you at the beginning, why do we seem to be the only species that has done this? Uh, if, it, if it seems to be some sort of relatively straightforward process, um, why don't we see other infinitely large languages uh, having emerged out of the however many millions of species that are created? Yeah, that's a hard question. Do you have, um, do you have any ideas on that? Well, I, I mean, I can tell you my pet crazy theories. Um, like, I, I, I think that, that we're, I think that, that our, our specialness is probably not in the bound. Our specialness is in dealing with complicated computational systems. So all of the arguments here depend on thinking about, you know, random programs and programs are, are complicated kinds of things. And so it could be that everybody, it'd be useful for anybody to communicate a lot of signals, but most of them don't have the, the kind of uh, computational abilities. And we somehow got the computational abilities, and because of that, where um, our bound kicks in, and then we like an infinite language. So you sort of need both parts. Both oh, sure, yeah, yeah. You need the yep. bigger processing, perhaps in general, in order to deal with these systems in the first place. Yeah, so, so, is, so it, is it stepwise? Is it one, then the other? Is it A, then B? You, you have to be able to deal with programs, right? You have to be able to deal with kind of representations that are algorithmic and that are arbitrarily complicated or something. And once you do that and you're trying to communicate, then you'll, you'll, like, you'll like systems that tend to have an infinite number of things. Um, but I mean, that's all speculation. So. You know, back to fixed point in a probably confusing way. I wonder about the role of neoteny in this whole process. The role of monotony? Neoteny. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you were paying attention. <laughs> um, um, wait, neoteny, that's, that's... That's the maintaining of um, um, children's um, properties into adulthood. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, Actually, Evan and I, uh, uh, Celeste and I, sorry, <laughs> um, have, have been working on a, 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 a kind of fun paper um, looking at uh, relationship between children and brain size. So um, if you have, the basic idea is like, if you have really premature children, then you have to be pretty smart to care for them. But if you're going to be smart, then you have to have a pretty big, big brain. And if you have a pretty big brain, then you have to have pretty oh. premature children. And so it turns out you can get a kind of feedback loop there where, where you get uh, brain sizes that go kind of off the chart with some really simple kind of evolutionary models. And stuff. So um, maybe that's not an answer to your question. But there's, no, there's, so, the something, <laughs> there's, there's something related somehow to, um, uh, to children, right? I mean, yeah. so one, 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 one thing that, that's, uh, that's notable about people, right, is not just language, but that our infants are really useless. So um, <laughs> figuring out, like, what it is about useless infants and smart people and big brains, I think, is an interesting yeah, and the properties that we have relative to our related species. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.